If you asked me in 2013, am I going to go to the next Paralympics, I would have laughed. Now she set her sights on Tokyo. There was a point in my high school career where I hated athletics. I didn't want to do it at all. Luzon definitely changes the way you see things. She changes your world. The relationship between guides and blind athletes are very special. Every time you go for a run, you have to trust that person completely. She opened up a different world when it comes to running. I definitely think it's good for me to have started much later with athletics because I think I have a lot more years left to compete at elite level. There's a lot of times and elements and aspects where you train in hope. You prepare for the worst and you hope for the best. I was in a good shape when I got to Rio. Everything literally went perfectly. And then when we were running the heat, we got disqualified because of a technical error. Not to send athletes. Olympics have been postponed. 2020 Summer Olympic Games will be postponed until summer 2021. We realized that we were going to Tokyo the day we got our second negative COVID test back. It's two days before you need to travel and you're still uncertain where you are going. You need to start and make your own life a success. Nobody's going to do it for you. If you're going to sit around and wait for that success to come, it's never going to come. I was born blind with a condition called congenital Leber's amaurosis, which basically, in a nutshell, means that my retinas did not develop properly during my mom's pregnancy. It's not a genetic transferable disease, so it's not something that I would struggle with as an adult if I had children. Obviously, at first, it was a big shock for my parents, but they really grabbed the situation with both hands and they really worked hard to develop me as much as possible as a young child. And at the age of six, they sent me to Pioneer School, which is a school in Worcester. And there I was in hostel all my school career and I matriculated there in 2011. And then I came back and, and studied at the University of the Free State and I'm working there now. It's nice to be closer to my parents and my family again because that was very tough growing up since the age of six being away from home. It was very important to my parents to make sure that I was an independent child and became an independent adult. My mom really made lots of effort when I was young with me in terms of she actually quit her job. She's a teacher, so for the first four years she was home full time with me and I had occupational therapy three times a week and they really did a lot of early childhood development with me to ensure that I could do things as normally as possible. I was never really a very sporty child. I was more sort of on the culture side of things. I used to participate, you know, but mainly for the fun of it. There was a point in my high school career where I hated athletics. I didn't want to do it at all. So yeah, it's, it's interesting the journey that I've been on. I definitely think it's good for me to have started much later with athletics because I think I have a lot more years left to compete internationally and to 
sort of compete at elite level, I think you can carry on as long as you sort of your mind and your body is ready to do so. The fact that I got into it later also sort of meant that my parents weren't as involved because I actually got into athletics as an adult and I didn't experience a lot of the pressures many athletes at school level face from parents and, and teachers and stuff. In what is one of sport's most unique professional partnerships, Klaus is literally Luzan's eyes every step of the way. We were always an active family. I can remember my first runs uh, was with my dad. When I got a bit faster, then, then I did some extra laps and or, or around the block, and, and he just kept on going on the normal route. They actually did two or three comrades, and, and then I decided, me and my brother decided we want to join. So running has been in our family, but always just as a social event. My first impression of Luzon was quite an uncomfortable impression. I had a running specialist store here in Bloemfontein and um, I was looking for employees. She calls me and she says, listen, yeah, I'm, I'm finishing up with my studies. I hear you're looking for people that's going to work with you. So now my first interaction with a blind person, I'm like, how do you want to sell shoes if you can't see? Showing my ignorance on the whole topic. She hit my feet totally under me. With her confidence and her self-belief in what she can do and my ignorance in what she's probably capable of. Being connected as a guard, it's definitely not something that came as an advertisement or, or something like that. I always want to say a godly intervention. Uh, definitely in my life, it's changed a lot. The relationship between guides and blind athletes are very special and unique. Every time you put literally your foot out the door and you go for a run, you have to trust that person. Trust has, in my opinion, two, two facets. Where The one is the physical component where you are the eyes. That's maybe the easier one. I mean, me and Luzon is basically the same length, so, so we've got the same stride, so we can trust each other. She will always tell me, don't be scared, because as soon as you are scared, I, I can feel it. I have to trust that she's capable of not falling, and, and she must trust that I will communicate if there's something that's really a significant obstacle. I think the more important thing for me when it comes to trust is about the relationship. When you do morning trainings, when you do late trainings, you go through tough times, great times as well, and you share that with that person. And sometimes you share insecurities or you share frustrations. That can only happen if you trust that person to nurture that moment and hold it with you. I think one of the most important parts of any sort of guide athlete's relationship is the fun element of it and running should always remain like enjoyable and fun and you should be able to laugh together and you should be able to share the good moments and the bad moments so you really have to be comfortable with the other person and it's a very unique relationship it's almost like having an older brother. I'm just blessed to be able to say that I'm running not only with somebody that's a great athlete but is also a friend. Rio 2016 Paralympic Games, Maracanã Stadium. The Paralympic flame. Senhoras e senhores, a chama paralímpica. And it is a light. If you asked me in 2013, am I going to go to the next Paralympics, I would have laughed. So the Rio Games, it was always a if I go, if I don't go, because I literally only was running f since 2013, so it was never a given that I was going to go to Rio. Katza with a lifetime best by around four seconds. She comes through in third place for South Africa. So the leading up to Rio, everything went smooth. I was in a good shape when I got to Rio. Everything literally went perfectly. And then at Rio, when we were running the heat, um, we actually would have qualified with the second fastest time and we got disqualified because of a technical error and it was nobody's fault that the error happened, but it happened. 
there's been a disqualification yeah. by the looks Coates, of it. Uh, Coates has been disqualified and it may have been the case of her guide helping her up the line. There will always be a little bit of blame for myself because I didn't know the appeal rules and I didn't know. You obviously don't go to a race thinking you're going to get disqualified and I wasn't prepared enough to know exactly what to do afterwards. So I was very emotional afterwards. And if I, if I just for that half an hour focused a bit more on what I actually needed to do and, and what I could do to change the situation, things might've been different. But I think the disqualification, it made me grow as an athlete. It was very disappointing at the time. I went through a, I want to say a grieving process because there was something and, and then all of a sudden it was taken away and it's not like you didn't just reach a final, it was like you never ran because you were disqualified so your time doesn't count, nothing counts, you don't go onto the world rankings, nothing. So ultimately I think it, it made me grow as an athlete, I realised that I can either give this thing a negative spin-off or I can give it a positive spin-off. There's a lot of rules and there's a lot of technical things that you have to keep in mind and, and keep account of. It was a tough time, but it was also a, a good time for me to grow. And yeah, I think eventually it turned out for the better. So when Luzon went to Rio, at that stage, it was sort of the beginning of our friendship. I was starting to do long runs with her. I was working very closely with her coach. He couldn't travel with her at that stage, so we were watching her from South Africa's side. And just after Rio, he said, yes, Klaus, just imagine if Tokyo 2020, you can go and do the marathon with her. So 1,500 meters was always on the court, but it sort of, Let's start getting her into that because Luzon is very good in the long distances. So I wasn't involved, but it was already part of the bigger picture, even if I didn't know it. So I think plans became a little bit more serious after Rio working towards the marathon in Tokyo. The marathon has always been sort of a distance that challenges me. I had a terrible first marathon. Terrible in the sense that I bombed out at 18 k's and there was 24 to go. It was in Soweto, it was just not a good experience and since then I've sort of feared marathon. To give you background on the world record for the T11, it was a three hours, 13 minutes, plus minus, I think. We went and we accredited the Soweto Marathon. It was Luzon's first marathon, and we went into it quite arrogant, thinking we're gonna break this record. And uh, uh, the Soweto came and it broke us. And we realized, okay, we, we actually need to go in with, with more than just a few long runs, and we need to go in with a game plan. Some strategies that we include is we, we discuss a race and we have a quite a detailed race plan. I do a lot of visualization by myself as well. What we do together is we would strategize and we would sort of try to calm each other's nerves. zon has got a lot of speed and she's very competitive. So my role is to make sure that she's got enough energy. She needs to finish strong. We had the privilege to do the Berlin Marathon in 2018, which really was amazing. It's a very flat course and the support along the road was really awesome. Comparing Rio to London, Paris Port is also big in London. There was lots of support for us there. I liked the London track better, but I think maybe it was because I wasn't disqualified on it. Something that you think is nice for a little while, but it becomes also a bit of a drag is how big those cities are. Things in Bloom are closer together and it literally takes you 15 minutes and you can go anywhere. The fact that Luzon stays on the University of the Free State campus and we've got 
a bit of more freedom of movement and less traffic makes a big difference. There's so many factors that plays a role that's not dependent on the individuals that's running. There's definitely a lot of outside factors. In a certain sense, we always train in a hope in terms of whether you're going to make a team, whether you're going to get funding to go, whether the, the competition is actually going to happen. After 2019, funding was cut completely. At the moment, we don't have funding yet going forward. There hasn't been much communication with regards to funding. We were always uncertain, but I'm very happy that SASCOC and National Lottery started getting involved and, and they assisted with, with, with the funding for the athletes. I think many fears creep in as you come closer to a race because you get more nervous. A big fear for me at one point in my career was competitors and the people I compete with, but I've worked a lot on that and I think growing as an athlete, it's, it's not that big of a fear for me anymore. I try to focus on my own goals. You prepare for the worst and you hope for the best. I feel sorry for athletes that were going to retire after Tokyo because they had a year longer to continue training. That puts a lot of stress on, on athletes. If it was me performing there as the athlete, um, I don't know if I would be able to carry that stress for an additional year and still be able to come up with the performance that, that they did and lose on that. Our athlete Lausanne Kutsia continues to train for the Tokyo Games which were postponed to next year. The 27-year-old has become much more confident since Rio 2016. I was actually a bit relieved. I sort of saw it as a blessing in disguise because it gave me more time to prepare. It was good to sort of get your head clean and then be sort of ready to be fully immersed in Tokyo and the preparations of it when things became normal again. Having developed a real self-belief that her world record goal in the marathon was very much a reality, the COVID-19 curveball meant preparations for Tokyo 2020 had to be adapted. The dynamics of Luzan and Klaus's relationship really came to the fore during these difficult times though. Not only when it came to developing the right race strategy, but also for cementing how their mutual trust and respect in each other is worth more than any kind of medal or time on the clock. We realized that we were going to Tokyo the day we got our second negative COVID test back because it was just before the third wave. It's two days before you need to travel and you're still uncertain whether, whether you are going. We had quite a few significant moments. So the first one was just before we started. Um, they didn't want to let us start because we had two athletes entered. Um, from, from, from 2020 uh, and, and there was actually only one running and they were looking for where's the second athlete. So it was two, two minutes before we went out onto to the, to the track, they only gave us the thumbs up to say, yes, you can go. Motivation when it comes to running as a guard for Luzon is definitely a two-way street. I'm, I'm lucky, I don't think we, we, we kept count because I think she probably motivated me more on trainings and in, in events than, than the other way around. But if needs be, I need to sum up the situation. If she wants me to talk a bit more and to tell her about the surroundings and sort of distract her on a road race, then definitely then I can do that. But sometimes she, she actually needs me to just keep quiet and give the necessary information. Tokyo with the marathon, at one stage we were alone in, in one of the busiest streets and I just told her what a blessing it was and afterwards 
we both realized it's a, it was a motivation moment. It wasn't intentional, but we, we both uh, experienced it as a moment of motivation. You need to adapt to make your runner have freedom of movement. It's about the athlete being able to run at her or his ability. Halfway in the race, I can feel Luzon is next to me like a little feather. She wants to go. The lady in front looks strong, but number two and three look tired. We're going to do this. We're going to get the record. We're going to get the medal. And then about four k's to go, I started cramping. From her side, she's very generous in the sense when I struggle and when she's stronger than me, that she doesn't get agitated. Uh, she doesn't get angry at me. She will then motivate me just makes me more tired, but, but she tries. I think how I'm able to trust others is I don't overthink things. If I trust you and something goes wrong, I wouldn't blame you. So I think for me, going into a relationship with an open heart and an open mindset and not, not overthinking how you're going to let me down, but rather focusing on what benefits there will be from the relationship and what value it will add to my life and to, to the other person's life, I think that's key. So now, it's another moment of, oh shucks, don't lose this, don't, don't do this. It's not over until it's over. We just need to keep our composure and, and need to, to focus on, on, on getting the few technical stuff correct because you can get so caught up in the moment that I do something stupid and maybe cross the finish line before Luzon or something like that. The last part was also a bit of concentration, but it was wonderful. We did two laps around the track in the Tokyo Stadium. And it was just, uh, as I told her at that stage, I said, I know you hurt, we're both hurting, but now you can enjoy this moment. There's nobody behind you. You can just take in the moment. Track is normally a very fast race. You, you sort of can't remember what happened but with long distance you've got opportunity to enjoy that moment, even though you, you, you just want to stop. The Zankertia of South Africa. Quite a few significant moments, but a lot of blessings that it worked out the way it did. There are tears, and why wouldn't there be? So much work goes into it. It's not just a physical race, the marathon, it's emotional as well. We are hopeful. I realized after Tokyo especially that in order for me to remain relevant, I'm going to have to set up a crowdfunding sort of system and, and get some, some help from maybe the public or, you know, certain companies for sponsorships. You know, you can't sit around waiting because eventually, you know, the world goes by and you need to remain relevant as an athlete. Unfortunately, you can't you can't not be relevant because then you, you miss deadlines, you miss races, you miss key times that you need to run to qualify for specific things. I'm very excited to go to Paris. We're going to do the 1-5 again as well as the marathon. So it was a very unusual combo, but we've realized that it, it works. Um, so, so that's what we're going to do for, for Paris. Um, and I would love to run a sub 430 1005 in, in Paris and a sub three hour marathon. Um, I think those are my main goals, irrespective of position. Those would be great goals for me to achieve. The most rewarding aspect of being a guide to Luzon is that it didn't happen intentionally. It happened and then the relationship started and it grew into something. It's been so rewarding. I will never be able to give back to what she's given to me, but I will definitely try to continue do, doing this, um, seeing that, that it's actually such a rewarding activity to do. Partnering with those who have the expertise for success, along with the desire to help you achieve your goals, is something that perfectly defines the success of Luzan Kutsier and Klaus Kempen. Their story is truly an inspiring one and one that certainly has many more exciting chapters still to be written. From the professionals behind South Africa's diverse professionals in terms of providing leading medical aid solutions, we look forward to following their journey to the London Marathon and Paris 24. For more episodes of Mind and Field, visit profmed.co.za. Mind and Field, brought to you by ProfMed, the intelligent medical aid choice for a diverse range of professionals.